you have your Bibles this morning, turn over to Numbers. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Probably one of my favorite books of the Bible. And you say, well, Brother Don, you say that every single time you start a new sermon series. And I guess so. I guess that's true. But I like Numbers. I'm not necessarily the sharpest knife in the drawer sometimes, so I like to have pictures. I like visual pictures that help me understand theological thoughts. And that's what the entire Old Testament is about. The entire Old Testament is a visual aid, a picture to us to help us understand who we are as believers in Christ and to help us live as we should as believers in Christ. Uh, you can find no better example of that than anywhere uh, other than the book of Numbers. It is a fantastic book. I don't know if we'll study all the way through it. I don't know how far we'll go. Uh, I know that I uh, wrote down about five or six sermons while I was on vacation. Uh, they just kept flowing and flowing and flowing. So we'll see how far they go. And if it looks like you're not being blessed by them, we'll go to another book and pick it up there. Amen? So Numbers chapter 1 and chapter 2. Now let me tell you what's going on. Uh, and there's a handout here if you want to look at the handout and outline. That's, that's here somewhere. In the book of Numbers, uh, the Jewish people, Israel, have been rescued from slavery to Pharaoh uh, in Egypt. And God has brought him, them out by his great power uh, through the Red Sea and into the wilderness. Now, you've got to get a picture of that, and we're not going to spend a lot of time about, a lot about that, but the picture of Israel following Moses down into the Dead Sea, out the other side, and then the waves collapsing upon Pharaoh is a perfect picture of what happened for each one of us when Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, it says that he entered into Hades, but not only did he enter into Hades, but he also he took our sins with him, and he left our sins in Hades. And then he triumphed over Hades, came out of the grave, rose from the dead, and now all of us who are in Christ, if you're in Christ, say amen, then all of us have come out on the other side and our sins have been left behind. Just as surely as Pharaoh's bones are still in the Red Sea, when we trusted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, our sins have been left behind in Hades and we no longer have to pay the penalty for those sins because our Lord and Savior Jesus has done that. It's a perfect picture, but that's not what we're studying today. What we're studying today is if you've seen uh, some of the movies, there's been several movies about the exodus of the Jews uh, from Egypt. If you've seen those movies, what do you always see? You always see like three million people kind of like in a herd or in a mob kind of going across the desert. That's what you see. That's the picture you get. And the reason is, is that's because the guys that write the movies don't really understand what the word of God says. Now, beginning here in Numbers chapter 1 and in Numbers chapter 2, and we're not going to read all of the verses. You can read those when you go home. But in Numbers chapter 1, Numbers chapter 2, God tells Moses that I want you to go among the 12 tribes, the only exception being the tribe of Levi, who were the priests. I want you to go among the 12 tribes, and I, I want you to number out all the men who are 20 years old and older because they're going to be your warriors as you go across this wilderness. And so he went tribe by tribe by tribe by tribe, and he numbered all the warriors in each tribe. And actually there's an account of how many warriors were numbered in each tribe. But the thing that I want to see you to see this morning is not only did he number the warriors, but God established exactly how the camp was to be set up every evening and how the camp was to proceed in their wanderings across the wilderness. So if you can get a picture of this, uh, I uh, started to do some sort of elaborate picture and put it up on the wall, but I think that you can understand this. If you just imagine this, picture this. Remember God had Moses build a tabernacle, and that tabernacle was the center of worship right up until the day that Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem. So here you've got the tabernacle and you've got the tribe of Levi right in the center of the camp. Why is that? Because the center of everything that the Jewish people are about, the center of everything that you and I are about is about what? Worshiping God. So the center of their lives as Jews was worshiping God. So the tabernacle and the Levites were right in the middle of the camp. All right, so let's say that that's north 
if that's north, then that's my east, okay? And so on the east side, it said there were three tribes. And we picked this up right here in Numbers chapter 2, verse 3. And on the east side, towards uh, the rising of the sun, shall they of the standard of the camp of Judah encamp throughout their armies. And it also says that with Judah will be the tribe of Issachar and the tribe of Zebulun. So every time they set up camp at night, on the east side, you'd have Judah, uh, Zebulun, and Issachar over here on the east side. Then it said down here in Numbers chapter 2, verse 10, it says, And on the south side shall be the standard of the camp of Reuben. And with Reuben would be Simeon and Gad. So down here on the south side, you'd have Reuben, Simeon, and Gad on the south side of the camp. So every time they, every time they set up camp, every time they marched through the, through the desert, the east side was Judah, and the south side was Reuben and those other two uh, 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 tribes. Then in verse 18 it says, that On the west side shall be the standard of the camp of Ephraim. And with Ephraim will be Manasseh, and Benjamin. So over here on the west side, you have these three tribes over here. And then on the north side, this is in verse 25, and the standard of the camp of Dan shall be on the north side, and with Dan shall be Asher and Naphtali. So you got the 12 tribes that surround the tabernacle, and you got one tribe in the middle. And you say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought Israel just had 12 tribes. Well, they did. But then Joseph, because he was faithful in Egypt, uh, his, his tribe was split into two tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. That's why you've got 12 tribes that surround the tabernacle and another tribe, the Levites, right in the middle. So here, get a picture of this. They numbered of the armies of each of these tribes that surround the camp. On the outside perimeter of the camp is where all the warriors would camp out at night. And then in the middle is where all the Levites would camp out at night with the tabernacle. And in between would be the women, the children, and the older people who could not be warriors. And that's how the camp went and camped every single day. And so later on when we see the cloud guiding them across the wilderness, they stayed in formation. They stayed in what? They stayed in order. So where does the sermon come from? That's very interesting stuff. But where is the sermon in all of that? Well, here's where I think the sermon is. The sermon in this is, is that as we begin 2016, I think our success, everybody that wants to be unsuccessful in 2016, say amen. Okay, nobody, okay. Everybody that wants to be successful in 2016, say amen. If you really want to be successful, say amen and raise up one hand. If you really, really want to be successful, say amen and raise up both hands. Amen. We all do. We'd be fools if we didn't want to. So here is a clue in God's word on how our lives, how we can begin this year and how our lives can be successful in 2016. Are you ready for the clue? Here's the clue. The clue is, is God wanted Israel to stay in order. He put them where he wanted them for his purposes and he wanted them to stay in order. So I believe what God is telling us here in 2016, he wants each of his children who are born again by the power of God, he wants each of us to get our lives into order. Now let me ask you a question. Is your life in order? Now if you ask me and Debbie that, I don't know. We're working on it. And, 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 and when you see the, see the sermon about how to get your life in order in a minute, it might give you some clues. I mean, life is, uh, life is a challenge. Everybody that grieves life is a challenge, say amen. See, you see who raised their hands? We've got a bunch of young folks here today. Most of the people that raised their hands that life is a challenge was the older people. The young people said, hey, life, this is easy. Nothing hard about this. Well, but you get a little older and life gets more difficult as you go along. I hate to lay that on you this morning, but life gets harder as you go along. I thought it would be easier. I thought by the time that I got to this age, things would just be flowing right along, but it's just absolutely the opposite. So let's talk about how we can get our lives in order this morning for 2016. So here's a couple of things. The first thing, by the way, I'll tell you this. It is hard to keep every aspect of your life in order. But just because it's difficult to do doesn't mean that we should not strive to do so. Because we will be better off and we'll be more successful if we can keep our life in order than if we don't. Number one, 
Number one is, and center and focus our lives, the center and focus of our lives must be spiritual. The worship of and the obedience to Jesus Christ our Lord must be paramount. In other words, the most important thing in our life, if we're going to be successful, and we want God's help, if you want to be successful and you want God's help and his favor, say amen, then the center of our life has to be God. Just like the center of the camp of Israelite was the tabernacle, and the worship of God, God has to be the center of our life. So how do we make God the center of our lives? Well, this morning we worship God. But during the week, do you ever worship God? Some of you, like me, you worship God uh, when you're driving or sitting at work or whatever. You'll play, uh, you'll play uh, Christian music just like we did this morning. You'll worship God that way. Some of you, when you're you have meditation time and you worship and you praise God. Some of you intentionally praise God during the day. My grandmother, who was Pentecostal, my whole life, uh, when she was working around the house, she was singing and praising God. In fact, you know, she did better worship around the house than we do here on Sunday morning, you know. And so uh, worship, you've got to intentionally worship and praise God. Number two, you need to talk to God continually, daily, in prayer. See, a lot of folks think that it, you, you set aside three minutes uh, in this room or three minutes in that room or three minutes over here. You pray to God and that's it for the day. Well, if that's it for the day, by the time you get to the day, you're going to have all kinds of things you should already talk to God about. Amen? Because you're going to encounter challenges all day long. So we pray to God continually during the day. How do we do that? We're at work. How do we do that? Just voice prayers to God. You talk to him. He talks to you. Can you keep working while you're doing it? Sure you can. It's easy. Because you want God to help you work and he makes your work better. Another thing that we all need to do daily, and I'm so proud of uh, one of my sons, I've, you know, I've got three sons, and, and one of them has really gotten into Bible study. And now if he doesn't study, he feels bad and he, he misses it. But we all need it to be into daily Bible study. Now you listen. I've been doing this a long time. And before I was a preacher, I was a teacher of youth for about 18 years. So... I can tell you right now that nothing will transform your life in relationship to your Lord and Savior Jesus as much as Bible study. Do you have to be a scholar? No. My grandmother uh, only had an eighth grade education, but she knew probably as much or more about the Bible than I do. And she understood not just the words of the Bible, but she understood the depth of the Bible. Did you know that the Bible is not just one layer? After you read the, if you read the Bible through in a year's time, you'll get that top layer. If you do it the next year, you'll get a couple more layers. And the more you study the Bible, you'll get layer and layer and layer. Listen, I've preached from some of these passages in the Bible 15, 20, 100 times sometimes. And every single time that I preach from the same passage that I preached from before, I can't use the same sermon because there's depths of understanding that I didn't have before. The Bible is layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of wisdom and knowledge. And for me, it's the very best way to get directly into the mind of God. All right, let's go on. What else do we need to do to get our act together, and to get our lives in order in 2016? Discipline your life physically. Discipline your life physically. I got in a really bad habit. I work about 80 hours a week. And I got in a really bad habit last year of not taking any time to exercise. You know, I've really never been sick. I've never, you know, none of that. I've just never, I've got a few colds and got pneumonia one time, but other than that, really, I've never been sick. And so I figured, hey, if it's not broke, don't fix it. But I'll tell you, while I was on vacation the last couple of weeks, I've exercised a lot every day. And uh, it's made me feel better. Not only has it made me feel better physically, but it's made me feel better emotionally, made me feel better mentally, and uh, I think that it maybe I'm a little bit more alert. Now, how long I can do that, I don't know, but you have to discipline yourself if you want to exercise. Exercise does not have to be painful. Exercise does not have to be in a $100 a day sports club or anything like that. You just get out and ride your bicycle. I mean, Atlanta is all hills. I mean, in about 20 minutes, you'll have about a, a major workout. Go out and Play golf, go out and play tennis, go out and walk around the block, you know. Uh, let your dog loose one day just for fun and chase him and see how, long, how far you go before you catch him, you know. Something or other, proper diet. We are what we eat. I started on a, a diet about two months ago, and I've lost about 10 or 15 pounds 
I am not where I need to be. I need to lose another 10 pounds, but I'm thinking about it every day and I'm watching calorie intakes. You say, that's just crazy. Well, it may be crazy if you're 27. It's not crazy if you're 65. And men, all you men that uh, once you hit 40 years old, I don't know what happens, but once you hit 40 years old, I had a guy tell me this. He says, Don, when you hit 40, your waistline is going to gain about four inches. And I told him, I said, I said, Mr. Throgmorton, you're crazy. Well, he was exactly right. So you need to start now, proper diet. Uh, we need to control our weight. All right, what's another discipline we need to do to have a successful 2016? We need to discipline ourselves financially. In America, we uh, are a country uh, that does not live within our means. If you go to almost any, I've been to a lot of countries all over the world. If you go to those other countries, they have to live within their means. If you go to Brazil, they have to live within their means. You go to Africa, they have to live within their means. Russia, they have to live within our ma their means. Why is that? That's because in, those in most of those countries, you can't borrow money. There's such hyperinflation, and et cetera, that it's almost impossible to borrow money because if you borrowed money with the hyperinflation, you can't pay back the loan. So consequently, uh, if you want to buy a car in Brazil, you've got to save the money to buy that car. If you want to buy a house in Brazil, you've got you to save the money to buy that house. In Africa, if you want to build a house in Africa, you've got to save the money to buy the land, then you've got to save the money to get the brick or make the brick yourself and build your house. It's that simple. But in America, we have pretty free-flowing uh, abilities to borrow money. And so consequently, what do we do? If we can't live within our means, what do we do? We live beyond our means and we borrow money. And what happens is, is then uh, we become slaves to those people that hold our, our mortgages and hold the different things that we borrow from, and it will create a lot of stress in our lives. So we need to live within our means, and if you're not living within your means, try to get that in order in 2016. Seek God's will and major decisions. <laughs> Debbie and I always wanted to live on 20 acres of ground with a great big house on it. We, we, we had that dream for about 10 years. And then God gave us that dream. He gave us a 10,000 square foot house on 17 acres. And then we got that house. And then we had to take care of that house. And we had to take care of the 17 acres of grass. We tried everything. We tried goats. We tried weed eaters. We tried, uh, you know, all kinds of things to get rid of that grass. And no matter what we did, the grass just kept coming back. And that house just kept having to be cleaned. And with four kids in a house that size, it had to be cleaned every day. It was a mess all the time. It was something else. So be careful because if you don't consult with God in a major decision, uh, it is probable that you will... Can, I don't know if I can say this in a sermon. Yeah, I'm going to say it anyhow. It's probable if you don't consult with God and you're going to make a major decision, you probably will do something stupid. And then here's what you'll be doing. Then you'll be saying, oh, Lord, get me out of this mess. How did I ever get in this mess? And God said, hey, I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> that's a fact. So we need to consult with the Lord before we do anything major, any major change in our life. Financially, if you want to have a successful year financially, you need to tithe. If you're not a tither, you need to become a tither. A tither is not just a regular giver. A tither is someone that gives 10% of their income some people say, well, Brother Don, do I do 10% of the net or 10% of the gross? Who cares? Do, do one or the other. Just do, just do one of them. It's okay. 10% of the net, I think, is fine. Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar. To God the things that are God. Give the taxes to Caesar. Give the 10% to the Lord. But tithe. And then above the tithe, sow freely to the Lord. S-O-W, not S-E-W. But sow freely to the Lord. And the Lord will what? Cause you to reap bountifully. What does that mean? That means is, is that if we maintain our discipline and our finances, we'll have some extra money, even beyond our tithe. And what the Lord has promised is those that sow uh, bountifully will reap bountifully. And those who sow, what? You know, a little bit, they'll, they'll reap a little bit. So God gives us this excess so that we can what? We can help people in the name of Jesus. So this year, try to carry around $5 bills or something other than these folks on the street that needs help, help them. And the more you help them, the more God gives back to you. All right, the next discipline, 
Family discipline. How many of you guys in here have children or have had children? Raise your hand. Yeah. You know, nobody prepares you for the first child. Uh, no matter how smart you are, no matter how young you are, no matter how strong you are, nobody prepares you for the first child. And when you're young and strong, you're also what? You're also arrogant. And what that means is, is that you're strong and arrogant, and so you decide that nobody needs to tell you how to raise your child, that you can do it on your own. You don't go and get sound wisdom from someone like Helen, who's had like ten children. Oh, it's five. I'm sorry, it's five. I doubled that, didn't I? I had five children. She'd be the one to talk to. Helen, what do we do after we have the first child? She'd tell you, don't have any more. <laughs> huh? Yeah, it got down to the last one. But the first child is tough. And here's what's going to happen to you. If you want to have your life in order, if this is your year that you have your first child, then what's going to happen this year is that if you're not smart and you don't seek some sound counsel, that child is going to drive you crazy. And instead of feeling young and strong and arrogant, and about after about the first month home with that child, you're going to be weak and wimpy and begging for people to come and take that child off your hands for a night or two. That's what will happen. Why? Because you let your children control your life. Now, here's the deal. <clears throat> we had four kids. We still have four kids, actually. The first two we didn't take control of at an early age. The last two we were pretty brutal with, but it worked. We took control. They were just little bitty fellas. They couldn't, con they're about that tall at the time, or that tall. They couldn't control me. I'm six foot one. They couldn't control me, but they can. A little bitty 18 inch or 20 inch long infant can control a six foot per tall person. They learn very soon how to control a person. So if you don't learn at an early age how to control your kids, your kids will do what? They'll control you. They'll throw your life completely into what? Disorder. I mean, the life that you thought you were going to live will be completely in disorder. And it's not just children. It's the same thing with parents. As you get older, your parents also get older. And as you have responsibility to take care of them, which you do if you're not careful, they can also control your life. They can also throw your life into disorder. Today, that's probably the greatest challenge that Debbie and I face. We've got four kids, we've got six grandkids, and, and we have one parent that's still alive. But we've been through three others who've gone from, from sickness into death. And so what will happen is between all of that, if you're not very careful, that family will control your life and throw your life not into order, but into disorder. So you have to discipline yourself in, into doing that. You have to discipline your life personally. You have to get on a daily schedule. Now Debbie's in here this morning and she's listening to me say that. And I'm a wild man. I do. I work 80 hours a week. And you know, I, I'll get up like, like I did this morning at 3 in the morning and just go to town and work till three in the afternoon or three the next morning. You know, I do that. So I'm, I can't say that I'm on a regular schedule and I'm going to work on that this year. You, you need to work hard, but you also need to learn to play hard. You have to set aside time for yourself. If you don't set aside time for yourself, some downtime, etc., you'll go crazy. And if you go crazy, your life will not be in order because your wife will leave you and then you will really be in disorder. Amen? So you got to have a good personal schedule and don't let anything take control of your life other than your spouse and your God. Amen? All right. You also have to have a disciplined life with your resources. Now, I'm not going to ask this question because I don't want to get personal with you this morning. You don't raise your hand. This is a rhetorical question. But who needs to clean the clutter out of your house? Who needs to get rid of all the stuff? I was at a funeral recently, and it was a wonderful lady who was a member of this church, and we were having, after, at the cemetery, we, the family was uh, saying nice things about her, and, and one of the sons, the oldest son, said, yeah, uh, mom was great, dad was great, but the only problem was is they collected and held on to everything he said, we even found a box that's, that, that was labeled thread too short to keep, and they kept it in a box, okay? So maybe this year you need to declutter a little bit. Now, if you're young, you might not have clutter yet. 
if you don't have clutter, try not to develop clutter. Try to keep things simple. Get rid of stuff. I see some people smiling, so you are closet clutterers. I can tell that. Uh, watch out for your flocks and herds. What does that mean? That means when you get too many vehicles or too many things that you can't take care of, get rid of something. Don't buy something that you can't, don't have the time to take care of because all it'll create, it'll create misery in your life and only keep the stuff that you need. Now Debbie and I are going to apply, apply that this year and we're going to get rid of a bunch of stuff around the house. You heard me say it. I, I'm, I'm promising you right now, okay? I'm promising you right now. All right, now. What's the point of the sermon today? Well, if you turn over to Numbers 23, in Numbers 23, Balak was the king of Moab, while you're turning over there, and Balak went up on top of a mountain, it's called Mount Peor, and he looked up from that mountain and he saw the camp of Israel. And he saw them camped by tribes and they had all their standards up as if it was like a three million man army. He saw the tabernacle in the middle of the camp which with all the badger skins over it would have looked like blood and underneath those badger skins was the shining uh, silver walls of the sanctuary. It would have just been a, an unbelievable sight in the center of there and all the tribes around, the warriors on the perimeter, all the standards of the tribes. He looked down upon their order and it scared him to death. And so he went and found a guy named Balaam who was a hireling prophet. And he paid Balaam. He says, listen, I want you to curse Israel so they won't conquer me. Well, God had already told them, don't conquer Moab because they're one of your cousins. But nevertheless, the king of Moab was afraid. So Balaam went and tried to curse him, but God wouldn't let him curse him. And here's an account of what Balaam saw in Numbers 24 too. It says, and Balaam lifted up his eyes... And he saw Israel abiding in their tents according to their tribes. And the Spirit of God came upon him. And he took up this parable and said, Balaam the son of Beor hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said, he hath said, who heard the words of God? Who saw the vision of the Almighty uh, falling into a trance but have, having his eyes open? How godly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel. In other words, Balaam the prophet saw the order of the camp of Israel and he stood in awe just like Balak. So in other words, when our lives are in order as believers in Christ, listen, if our, if our lives are out of control, Satan's not afraid of us. He's already got us. But when our lives are in order and we're on top of things and Satan sees that in our life, it scares him to death. It scares him to death. So, if our lives are in order, and we do a good job in 2016 with all these things, what's going to happen? Here's a promise I'll give you. Here's what's going to happen. Satan will attack us. And here's how Satan, Satan attacks us. Look over at uh, Numbers 25. In Numbers 25, verse 1, this is called the doctrine of Balaam. It is such a horrendous thing that Balaam came up with that he told king, the king of Moab about that even Jesus refers to the doctrine of Balaam several different places, but twice in the Revelation. And it, here is the doctrine of Balaam. 25, Numbers 25.1 And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit a harlotry with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. That's the god of the mountain of Peor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. So in other words, once you get your life in order, beware. Listen to me now. Once you get your life in order and you think everything is ordered, everything's okay, beware. Because what that means is, is God, uh, God will not allow you when your life's in order, God's not going to allow you to be t attacked from the inside out. But what God will allow, he'll allow Satan to ta attack you from the outside in. And so what will get us in 2016, if we're not careful, is temptation. That's what got Israel. Israel had 3 million people. They had 603,000 warriors surrounding the camp. They had the tabernacle of God in the middle. They were powerful. They scared all the enemies, all the people that lived in those lands in Palestine. They scared them to death just by coming into the... But Balaam said, listen, Balak, here's what you got to do. 
get all of the prettiest women of Moab and send them out there and let them walk around the camp. And literally that's what they did. Thousands of them. And what happened is some of those guys that were supposed to be on duty, some of those warriors at the perimeter supposed to be protecting Israel, those guys dropped their spears, they dropped their shields, they dropped their protection, uh, they dropped their swords, they dropped everything, and they ran after those women of Moab. And it just kept happening, kept happening, kept happening until, until it was so terrible that a guy named Phineas, who was the nephew of Aaron, the high priest, he says, this has got to stop. This has got to stop. Temptation is destroying our camp. This has got to stop. So here's the deal. Maybe in order for you to get your life in order, you've got to quit giving in to some temptations. I don't know what the temptation is, but I know this. Every single one of us in this room, if you're in this room, say amen. All right, it's just a test. Every single one of us in this room have temptations that we give in to a lot. Satan knows how to get us, and he gets us if we're not careful. So we have to be aware that he's trying to get us. We have to be aware that he wants to destroy our camp. We have to be aware that he wants to destroy our home. We have to be aware that he wants to destroy our marriage. We want to be aware that he wants to destroy our relationship with Jesus. We have to be aware of these things. So that when these temptations come, we're not like the soldiers, the Israeli soldiers, that threw down their weapons and went after the Moabite women. Instead, we're like Phineas, who was a Levite. And when he saw the children of Israel given into this temptation, he took a spear and he began to kill those Israelites that went after those Moabite women and he began to kill the Moabite women. And then other members of the camp, when they saw what was going on, they went out and participated so they could get rid of that temptation out of their life. They could get rid of that out of their life so they could go back to being a strong unit, an ordered unit, an ordered camp that no force on earth could overcome. And in one day's time, it says here in the Bible... Verse 9, and those that died in the plague were 24,000. 24,000 people died, had to die, before the camp was holy again. See, God wants our camp, our lives, our families, he wants us to be holy. That's probably his number one requirement of our lives. He wants us to be holy. So today... If you want to have a good 2016, get your life in order. Start living a holy life that is focused upon God. And the Bible tells us in about 103 places that when we live lives focused upon God, we experience God's favor. And that literally means that God moves us from the back of the line to the head of the line. That literally means that we go from being the tail to be in the head. I don't know about you, but I'd rather God move me from the back of the line to the front of the line. I'd rather be the head than the tail. Amen? So in other words, that's our motivation for getting our act together and getting our lives in order. It is a really good New Year's resolution. It will not happen overnight because if you've lived very long at all, uh, your, your life probably has a lot of things that need to be corrected before you could say, my life is in order. But it is a really good New Year's resolution. I want all of us this year to live within the favor of God. But in order for that to happen, we have to get our act together. If you're ready to get your act together, say amen. Father, I thank you for the day and I thank you for the saints who have gathered here today to praise you. And we have praised you today, Lord. I thank you for the ones that have come here today to hear your word. Lord, that you would burden all of us with things in our life that we need to get rid of. Clutter, uh, spiritually, spiritual clutter, physical clutter, emotional clutter. Uh, maybe, Lord, there's some people we need to forgive to get rid of that clutter. Uh, Lord, uh, financial clutter, anything in our life, Lord, that is cluttering up our lives, creating confusion in our lives, and keeping us from being close to you. So, Lord, we want to live power-filled Christian lives filled with your favor, filled with your love, your mercy, your grace. So Lord, 
teach us how to do that. Help us to apply this sermon to our life today. Lord Jesus, we do love you, and we praise your holy name. And everybody said, Amen. Let's stand up. We're going to